Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Zoom series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis, and today we are excited to welcome Andrew Cambrell to talk about roadmaps to an ecological civilization. Last Saturday, Randy Hayes spoke about five systems of societal shifts that are required in order to move toward an ecological civilization. And he also talked about roadmaps to climate solutions, which Andy will be talking more about today. And before he begins, I'd like to say a little bit about his background. We were talking about music before we started today because Andy is a um, professional, was a professional pianist. Um, he is also a public interest attorney, which most of you know of his career, and author, as well as an advocate for sustainable agriculture. He is the founder and executive director of the Center for Food Policy in Washington, D.C., and is the co-founder of Foundation Earth, an environmental think tank. Kimbrell has been at the forefront of legal challenges to genetically engineered crops and lawsuits forcing the FDA to adopt new safety regulations. His legal work has also helped maintain the integrity of organic standards. He has testified numerous times before the US Congress and he pioneered the legal strategy that led to the Supreme Court ruling that DNA is not patentable due to it being a product of nature. Kimbrell was named by Utney Reader as one of the world's leading 100 visionaries. So welcome, Andy. It's great to have you with us here today. Uh, Georgia, thank you for having me back. And it's um, always great to be with you. And I just respect so much all the work you do as well. It's just, um, uh, it's, uh, it's always a joy to be with you. And I hope many of you um, had the chance to hear Randy Hayes, my partner in crime on Saturday. Um, uh, I think um, he I think he did, a, as always, a great job. And I like the way he put it, say, trying to create the time we need in order to make these transformational changes. And if those who, if you haven't heard it, please you know, access it um, because he really talks about what a lot of people are doing. And I like that he does that. He talks about some of the major people around the world who are coming together in great numbers sometimes, whether it be the climate crisis or nature needs half. And he also talks a lot about you know the dire straits we're in, about what's happening to a lot of our species. And, and he answered a lot of very important questions, including a really good question that you had, George, about what's the role of the military industrial complex in all of these things these days. So really a good presentation. And, and I am not going to repeat it. I'm going to assume that you've heard that. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach um, to the idea of uh, transformation. I always find it too, I know David Corton likes the term ecological civilization, and so does Randy. It seems a little grandiose to me. So I'm going to talk about possibly a transformation into an ecological society. Civilization just seems um, a little too cosmological for me. So, um, and um, I want to do so in kind of a, and by the way, I have two, uh, a couple of things to start with. One is that um, uh, that uh, Taylor Arbuckle, who's uh, our policy and climate coordinators, I think on this call, and one of the reasons she's on the call, A, because she, she can participate and probably ask the most difficult question at the end of it, but also that, you know, often during, you know, our time, you've seen this, Georgia, sometimes I'll mention things and people say, I'd like to get that article or what are you talking about there? And so Taylor can take that down and take the, that pressure off you and me, Georgia, make sure that people who who want something who put it in the chat or email afterwards can get the materials if, 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 if that does come up. Uh, the second thing is I apologize for that I will be sometimes light and dark. There's an issue with my computer sometimes. Um, and it's not actually calibrated to what I'm saying. So I won't necessarily get dark when it's very negative or depressing and light when it's optimistic. See, um, and the last thing is that my eyesight's not great. So I can't see what's going on in the chat uh, without taking off my glasses and getting very, very close to the screen, uh, which no one wants to see, trust me. Um, so, uh, you know, Georgia or Taylor, you know, if there's something in the chat that, that requires, especially during the question and answer period that requires attention, please let me know because I won't be able to do that. Um, so I thought I'd start today with um, with sort of how what, what Randy was talking about and I was talking about how that fits in sort of a theory of change because we keep hearing about you know, change here but how, what, what's the theory of change here and I wanted to share with you my theory of change that I've been sort of working you know from for the last uh, thirty five years and um, it really begins with a story I heard when I grew up I was grew up in New York City was part of the New Left. And uh, we didn't take necessarily kindly to those who were called hippies in those days and to the new age movement when it came down. We were new left. Many of us were 
uh, pretty well educated Marxist theory and others, uh, similar theories. Uh, and so a little story went around. This is how the story went. The story went is that a guy trips out of a bar, obviously drunk, and he gets hit by a car. And there's two people there. There's the new age man or woman, and there's the new left man or woman, right? And the 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 new age guy's just sort of standing. The new left guy immediately gets into action, right? Takes off his coat, puts it under his head, takes a tourniquet from his shirt, rips it to stop the bleeding, says somebody call 911, right? And he, you know, he stops, starts doing, you know, EMT work on, on the guy. And meanwhile, the new age guy is saying, you know, this guy has a terrible lifestyle. I mean, he's grossly overweight. He's clearly an alcoholic and has compensatory compulsion issues, right? It, it, this man is a is a mess. He he really needs some kind of either and psychological and physical. And by the way, what about exercise? You know, maybe that's something he needs, right? And so this was the story would tell about the uh, the new left versus the new age. And it took me a while, and I was thinking about that a few years later. And I actually wrote a piece on this for Utney Reader. Um, that actually they're both right. <clears throat> yeah, you need the person to stop the bleeding. Absolutely, you're not going to lose the patient. But unless that gentleman changes his lifestyle, he'll be out on that street again. He'll be hit again, right? Unless he changes his lifestyle, he will, or one of the one of these diseases he's subject to will get will kill him. So you you need to stop the bleeding, but unless you change the consciousness, it's going to happen over and over and over again, and you will not have accomplished your goal. And that's my theory of change. Stop the bleeding. And change the consciousness. Now, the vast majority of things I do in my day work is stopping the bleeding. We litigate, you know, we we do policy work to stop that biocide slash pesticide from being approved, from uh, saving a community from some horrifying animal factory, from making sure that there is not um, a destruction of our organic standards going in there, right? Right? Doing everything we can to litigate to make sure that you know, global warming gases are limited, including going to the Supreme Court in case that we won. So there's a lot of important work being done in stopping the bleeding. Because unless we stop the bleeding, there's not going to be anything left for this transformation we're going to be talking about this evening, right? So you need to stop the bleeding. But there's never going to be enough of us to stop that bleeding, which is now becoming, you know, rampant, unless we change the consciousness that's behind the actions that are causing the bleeding, right? This is not, you can't get enough environmental lawyers. You can't get enough even good legislators, much less the ones that we have, to actually stop anything, right? Unless the consciousness, and it's often a pathological consciousness, as we'll get into, that's, that's causing this is somehow addressed. Stop the bleeding, change the consciousness. And the difficulty here is quite often these are not seen as the, you know, the effort that it needs to be a combined effort. They're often opposed to each other. So people say to me, hey, you know, Andrew, how come you spent seven years stopping GMO wheat? Why weren't you writing? Why weren't you talking? Why weren't you getting the message out on how we need to change the consciousness? And meanwhile, my lawyers and my organization saying, why are you writing about salmon economics and cold evil and all these issues when we, you know, so many cases, so little time, Andrew, so many cases, so little time. Don't waste it on this highfalutin stuff that isn't getting us anywhere. So quite often there's sort of an opposition as there was between the new left and the new age. But they really do go together. So that's my theory of change. And if we're going to get change, we have to stop the bleeding here the best we can with as many good uh, you know, organizers, grassroots organizers, uh, litigators, policy people as we can, nationally and internationally. But unless we change the consciousness, and that's the part that so often is not really being addressed, in my view, not being sufficiently addressed anyway, is changing the consciousness behind it, because otherwise there's never going to be enough of us. All right? So that's the theory of change. But here we're not just talking about change, are we? Right? Here, in you know, this is what Son Georgia put under the title of this transformational change. Whoa. So we're not just talking about change. We're not about reforming. We're not talking about going and, and improving the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. We're not talking about making certain standards, you know, at, in the COP meeting in Egypt or the next one that's coming up. Those are reformist changes, but they're not transformational change. At the conclusion of the IPBES report that came out in 2019, 50 countries, 145 scientists, doing the best they can to assess the damage the humans are doing to the biodiversity of the planet. Uh, and and, and the, their findings were unsurprisingly grim. 
looking at a million species facing uh, extirpation in the near term. We're looking at, you know, virtually the entire webs of life being frayed all around the planet, right? But they end on a slightly more hopeful note. They said, nature can be restored if we make transformational change. And by transformational change, we mean systemic change of our politics, our economics, our technology, our aims, our paradigms, and goals. So that's 145 scientists, right? 50 countries. So they, they saw it too. But the question is, how do you make transformational change? How does that happen? Right? So I was thinking about this for this talk. And I said, you know what? What does it take to make personal transformational change, particularly spiritual transformation? What are the steps towards transformation that we know of in the spiritual traditions and in the psychological traditions? Uh, you know, uh, along with my law degree, I have a master's degree in, in psychology, especially, you know, depth psychology. So I used, I thought about some of that. And, you know, I think there's sort of seven steps that can be useful to us here when we're looking at what it really takes to make transformational change. Let me quickly go through them. The first one is you got to have a vision, right? What are you going towards? If it's spiritual change, you know, are you going to go through a sort of a Jungian holism, holism, holy thing, right? Is it, is it going to be... In the Hindu tradition, the Christian tradition, where do you, how do you see your spirituality growing? How do you see you completing in that, right? Here, what is your vision? What's the vision we're talking about? I think, you know, calling it an ecological civilization society is fine, but what does that mean, right? And how often do you see people in the environmental movement actually saying, here's my vision, right? Remember Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Well, what's your dream? What's your vision, everybody? What is it? So I'll tell you mine, if you tell me yours. Um, and I'm going to be borrowing heavily from Father Thomas Berry on this, uh, my great mentor and friend. And uh, sad he's no longer with us. But the idea certainly is reinventing the human kind of, at, the, at least the modern human, at the species level. So that we can live in a mutually enhancing way with the other Earth communities. And with that awe-inspiring, multi-dimensional multi being that we call the Earth, that is the Earth, right? So how can we sort of reinvent ourselves at the species level to live in a mutually enhancing way with the other life communities on the Earth, non-human life communities, but also with that multi-dimensional being that is the Earth, right? But that's mine, you know, and each of you can have your own. Okay, so that's the vision. And I imagine that many of yours would be similar, maybe different words, different contexts, but that's, the, so the second step is, Diagnosing the obstacles to that, right? What, what's stopping us individually, collectively from reaching that goal? This is the vision. If you don't have a vision, forget it. If it's just, oh, we got to do this reform change or this environmental change or, you know, we, you know the G7 is going to come together to talk about climate. No, no. They say 50 countries, 145 scientists, we need transformational change. I'm with them. But you can't do that without a vision. They don't provide a vision in that otherwise wonderful report. So we need to have a vision, a much better vision in our, our community that's, that's better expressed. It doesn't have to be the one I just came up with, but we have to have that vision. Then we have to make a really sophisticated analysis of what the obstacles are to going there. What, what, what stands in our way, right? And we'll be talking about several of those, uh, but you can go alphabetically if you want. And I would start maybe A for avarice for A, bellicosity for B. But when you hit C, boy, you've got, you know, uh, collusion capitalism. You've got commodification, right? You've got corruption. You've got co-option, right? You have consumerism. You've got chauvinisms of all sorts. That's just the C's. So, you know, you can pick your own C's from there. Uh, I would say computer addiction might be another C. Um, and so we have to look at that very honestly, all of us. And when we look at that, we look at our vision, we look at that in order to, to confront them. We need courage. That's three. Vision, diagnosing the obstacles, and courage to face them. It takes courage. It takes a lot of courage, right? To face this, right? It's, it's daunting. Let's just cut past it, I think, to myself a lot. I don't know if you guys ever do. 
Now, why do I have to spend my life like this? But we do, many of us, right? So after courage, of course, you have to have the energy. That's why we take care of ourselves. We need to take care of one another in this movement. We have to be careful we don't burn out. We have to be careful that we do sufficient self-care, that we have the energy together, both individually and collectively, to do this and to encourage others to have that energy, right? The next one after that is faith. Faith in two ways. Faith in our vision and faith in our capacity to get there, or at least to go towards it in a very serious way. The sixth step is sacrifice. There's no way we're getting this without sacrifice, both collectively and individually. As I said, many of us have devoted our entire life to this. Unless you're Shirley MacLaine, I think you only get one time. And, you know, we're devoting our lives to this. And the last one, of course, is accomplishment, communion. Some of us Jungians would use the word called conjunctio. But I think the only reason we use this word conjunctio, meaning conjunction, is because Jung's name is hidden in it, conjunctio. So I think that's the reason he used it all the time. Um, no, I don't think that was the reason, but maybe it was, but never knows. So when we look at the, the journey ahead of us here, we I don't think we've done a very good job, and I haven't done a very good job in the past, of really explaining that we need to have this vision. We need to diagnose the obstacles. We need courage. We need energy. We need faith. We need to understand it will be, require sacrifice. I know that you know Randy's been uh, in jail seven, at least 17 times in about 12 different countries. So sometimes it actually is even that. We know that through the great movements of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, it often takes great sacrifice for transformational change, right? But the reward is that we go towards accomplishment, towards a sense of communion. And in my vision, we get closer and closer to having a mutually enhancing relationship with the other earth communities and with the earth itself, which means that all of us can be more fully human because we're not fully human unless we have that relationship with our fellow creatures on the earth, right? We're, we're, we're only very partial humans at that. Right? So that's for me is at least one roadmap for transformational change. So you've got the theory of change, right? Stop the bleeding, change the consciousness and the change in the consciousness, this is at least one roadmap towards changing that consciousness, right? So within that, I have uh, some, not subdivisions, I guess subvisions. Um, and on the visions thing, I should note that uh, Georgia did say uh, that Utney Reader, correct, you know, she was correct, didn't name me as one of the 100 top visionaries in the country a while back. And they actually had asked some of us to go and give speeches at Town Hall in New York. There's about 20 of us, I think, of the 100 uh, that were able to go. And we had five minutes each. So it's, you know, not a lot of vision in five, but you do what you can. Uh, but I noticed I was the fourth speaker, a fifth speaker. And the first four had very thick glasses, which I do as well. And that's when it occurred to me that maybe to be a visionary means you really can't see at all. So uh, when I talk about vision or I talk about subdivision visions, you should take that with a grain of salt. Um, so let me go through a few of these paradigm shifts um, at, the, um, at the paradigmatic level. Um, and the first is pretty obvious. I think we need to move from our current reliance on industrial extraction to ecological regeneration, right? It is very clear that whenever we extract nature faster than it can regenerate itself, whenever we do this, right? Everybody on this call, I, mean, I, I know a lot of you know this, you know, but as I get older, I sometimes realize I don't need to be instructed, I just need to be reminded. So if I'm reminding you of anything, then I've accomplished my goal, because I think all of you already know all this. But yeah, from industrial extraction to ecological regeneration, ending the age of extraction and moving into the age of regeneration, we will not be able to get into an ecological society unless it's based in regeneration rather than extraction. And our entire industrial world thing, as Richard Heinberg would be the very first and the last to tell you, is based in extraction, right? And every time you extract nature faster than it can regenerate itself, you are guaranteeing scarcity, extinction, and ultimately planetary death. No argument, empirically true. Every time we extract nature faster than it can regenerate itself, water, forest, fish, soil, whatever we do that, and we do it, that's our entire society is based on that, entire economy is based on that. It guarantees scarcity, it guarantees extinction, and it guarantees 
ultimately planetary death. So talk about a paradigm shift and talk about how pathological it is to not know that. How rarely you hear it from Sierra Club, how rarely you hear it from NRDC, how rarely you hear it from any of our politicians. And it's so simply true. It's incredibly simple, right? But it's also pathological. How can you have an entire economy, entire society, industrial civilization, if you will, that's based on what is clearly a false premise, that somehow you can continue to extract something faster than it can regenerate itself? Nobody would think that with their bank account or their savings account, right? It's so simple. And yeah, so that's, I think, one of the primary ones that we have to constantly remind the general public of. We have to constantly remind people that that pathology is one of the obstacles we face, that people are entranced in that pathology that we can continue to extract beyond the regenerative powers of nature. And that's just not going to work. And a uh, second paradigm um, is the idea that we need to go from eradication to biodiversity promotion. We all remember Aldo Leopold saying, you know, any action that increases biodiversity is good. Any action that decreases biodiversity is wrong. Simple as that. My great friend Doug Tompkins always used to say, how we interact with biodiversity is the marker of the success or failure of the human project. And I always loved that. Doug was absolutely right, as he so often was, right? So in a lot of the field that I work on, right, which is agriculture, it's entirely based in eradication, right? And industrial uh, civilization has done that from the beginning. We came upon indigenous peoples who had a different way. I mean, now in many ways, an infinitely superior way to the industrial model. What do we do? Eradicate. We try to eradicate their cultures. We literally eradicated them. Almost entirely in many places, right? But we still do the same thing, right? Think of the untold billions of tons of insecticides, herbicides, fungicides that are spread and blanketing the planet. So the industrial agriculture, right, can't with its monocultures that encourage each one of those, can continue to survive. About 40 or 45 percent of that agriculture is based right now in the United States in genetically engineered corn and soy that feed nobody. They feed animal factories and they feed cars and they create high fructose corn syrup. They're field corn. It's not corn that people eat, right? That's 45% because that's the bottom line, right? But the myth was, again, a pathological myth that nature would not bat last, that we could just keep eradicating forever, right? They teach adaption in first grade science in the Washington DC school system, first grade science. And yet Monsanto and these companies have gone to Congress and said, oh, no, they won't adapt. Don't worry. The weeds won't adapt. The insects won't adapt. The fungi won't adapt. Of course, oh, and of course, in medicine, oh, no, we can have antibiotics forever. We'll just kill all the bacteria, eradicate them forever, right? We can eradicate whole elements of biodiversity and get away with it forever, right? Pathological paradigm. And again, our entire food system and much of our medical system is based exactly right there. Right? So the obvious, the obvious the paradigm we need to shift to, just like we needed to shift from eradication to regeneration, we need to shift from eradication to biodiversity is the answer, right? So what's the answer to antibiotics is probiotics. Right? What's the answer in our agricultural system? Is getting rid of all these horrifying toxins, these biocides, as Rachel Carson calls them in the last two pages of Silent Spring. They're not in, they're not pesticides. Every time you use that word, please don't use it, right? Because that gives people the idea that they somehow have been designed only to kill so-called pests. They don't. They kill everything. They're biocides. They kill everything. They kill birds and animals and fish and humans, right? So the opt we have agroecological methods now, proven agroecological methods that use biodiversity as the actual fundamental aspect of agriculture. Right? Biodiversity has to be the central aspect of agriculture. Right? I have what I call the broad approach to the future of our feeding ourselves in a mutually enhancing way with the rest of the planet. Broad, B R O A D. And the first one, that B, is for biodiverse not just in the seeds and the plants we use for food, but a food system that treats all the other biodiversity with the same respect, protect and preserve. R stands for regenerative. O stands for organic. 
A stands for agroecological, I like appropriate scale too, and D for democratic control versus corporate control, right? It's so the broad approach. That's what we need to transform to. That's what we, you know, Taylor and myself and Randy and our team went to Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. And this is what we were telling the folks there about climate and how agriculture is one third of the entire climate crisis. And this is the answer. This is the paradigm shift we need. All right. So the next one, I, I don't know, I'm looking at this. I know this stuff by heart. Um, <laughs> but the next one is one of my very favorites, which is the market economy, right? Or market, market economics uh, needs to transition to what I call economics. And let me explain that for a second. So obviously the root of economy is the same as the root of ecology. But nomos, do people know what nomos means? Greek laws. So actually we had the right name, economy. But it wasn't used in any way related to the laws of nature, right? It was completely disembedded from that and had to do with the distribution of wealth within, among humans and human society, right? But economos, economics, returns the word to its root, the laws of ecology, because our economics has to be a wholly owned subsidiary of ecology, or we're not going to be around for very much longer, right? And it will take most of the planet with us, right? But I, the pathology behind market economy, though, is, you know, so Carl Polanyi is one of my favorite writers. I write, if you have, any of you haven't read The Great Transformation, get it. To me, it's much better than, than Marx um, and as far as analyzing where we've been and where we're going to go. Um, kind of just really brilliant guy. But the idea that you have a supply and demand system and treat all of nature as a commodity within that system is, again, pathological, right? I mean, if everybody wants tuna fish sandwiches, the tuna fish don't know that. They haven't read Adam Smith. They haven't read Milton Friedman. They haven't read von Hayek. They don't know about supply and demand. They don't say, we've got to reproduce. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Demand. Demand. The trees don't know it. The soil microbes don't know it. The aquifers don't know it. So anybody who's defending the market economy is part of the problem. A big part of the problem. And I know, I read the theory of moral sentiments too, Adam Smith. He wasn't such a bad guy. I get it. But I'm sorry. Market economics is pathological. Treating nature as a commodity within a market economic system is a no-go. Because it's going to take us right back to paradigm one. We're going to be extracting because demand increases, extracting an element of nature faster than it can regenerate itself. So again, we have to begin to think of ecology as the basis of economos. We can only have our own, if you want to call it economy, economy when it obeys the laws of ecology. And the market economy is in its sort of Midas touch way of turning everything into a commodity, which takes away its value and its life. Right? Nobody's read Midas, I guess, that, that's in, you know doing in Chicago school. Uh, University uh, Chicago, you know, because they clearly haven't learned the lesson of that old myth. So that's really, really, really critical that we really understand that. I have never heard Sierra Club come out with that, NRDC come out with that, any environmental group top 10. I've never seen a single critique of market economy. Nothing. It's so easy what I just told you, right? You can't do this. They're not commodities. They're fict fictitious commodities, as Carl Polanyi called them, right? It's going to end in the kind of catastrophe we're talking about. So unless we know that that's a paradigm, and a, again, a patholo pathological paradigm, right? And I'm going to talk about where these pathological paradigms come from if I have time. And, and do remind me, do tell me, George, if I'm going way up, way past time stuff here, because right? I've got a lot, to, <laughs> I had a lot to share with you folks today, as you could probably imagine. Um, so uh, the other one, of course, is very close to, I'm gonna, I don't know, uh, we, Thomas, Thomas Berry's birthday was a few days ago. So I'm thinking of my dear friend um, and mentor. Uh, but of course, he's always talked about education, right? And since, you know, we're living beings and sharing this planet, which is itself a multidimensional being, as, as we know, the guy hypothesis, which is now, thank God, being accepted by, you know, uh, mainstream science to a great deal. Um, how can we tell our story without understanding its, its relationship to ecology? How can we talk about history? How can we talk about economics? 
How can we talk about politics unless we see ourselves within that larger context? Both our relationship to the earth, the history of our relationship to the earth with indigenous peoples, what happened with the advent of agriculture, what happened then with the industrial revolution, where we are with the technological revolution, those aren't hum merely human concerns. Everything we've done had an effect on the rest of nature. And if we make a war on nature, as Rachel Carson said, every war we make on nature is a war against ourselves. Through the climate crisis, we are committing species suicide, albeit unconsciously, right? We're not going to suddenly be okay here. And I, and I don't think that, you know, various billionaires are going to get us to the planets quickly enough. I really don't. So we're stuck with the earth that we're making war on because we're making war on ourselves. Well, that has to be the cornerstone of education. For anybody who's, who's young and, and, and coming in, in any grade, you can teach them about adaption. You can teach them about every one of these paradigms easily, right? If you have your piggy bank and you've got, you know, a dollar in there and dimes, right? But every day you take out two and only put in one, what's going to happen, kids? Right? I'm sorry, it's that simple. So that if we don't change our educational system from an anthropocentric system to an ecologically based system, we are not, we're gonna have generation after generation that is still ensconced in these paradigms, right? And, um, that is not going to help us change consciousness. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite of changing consciousness. It's reaffirming these pathological paradigms that we have to transform away from a ecological society. So the next, um, the next two I want to talk about is, and to me, if somebody were to ask me, what is the most, the biggest obstacle we face, the biggest paradigm shift we have to make of all of these? Um, and I'm going to get to a psychological thing right after this. But as far as just in the same manner in which I'm speaking about this, it would be nationalism and the nation state. We have invented uh, 193 countries in the United Nations. Most of those countries have been created in my lifetime. Uh, even countries that somehow young people probably think were there forever, like Germany created what? after the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, right? Italy about the same time, right? Most of the countries in Africa, are, again, are younger than I am. So it's not like the nation state is some thing that nature gave us, quite to the contrary, right? Nothing in nature, nothing obeys national boundaries, zero, much less subdivisions like the 50 states, nothing, right? Even a nuclear explosion in Japan. Uh oh, how did that that radiation get into Sacramento, California? Yeah, how did that happen? It did happen, right? We know, right? All the interrelated mutualities, synergies, complex levels of organization within this multidimensional planet, none of them respect any national boundaries. So we've created an entire political system which is based on nationalism, chauvinism, the growth of power, economic power, right? It's the, it's the and, I, I, and I don't mean good tribalism, it is the unholy marriage of tribalism with bureaucracy, right? And not only that, it's mostly anti-environmental because they don't want anything that will stop the economic GDP growth of their country. And they know if they're in power and the economics, economics go down, they'll lose power, right? And they'll go to war and they'll colonize and they'll take advantage of other people's resources, destroying their countries in order to create wealth for that country. And it is unbelievably emotionally strong. You have people who have been suffering from discrimination, people in the black community, for example, in poverty, and yet they will send their daughters and sons to die in overseas, in, in die in Iraq, right? They, uh, you know, and that shows you how strong this is, right? They will cry when the national anthem is played, right? So it creates a tremendous psychological block, a deflection from our loyalty to the planet, to the loyalties of these political divisions, which are completely disembedded from ecological reality. 
Well, you're not going to get to an ecological civilization with that in place. Not going to happen, right? And we saw that in Egypt. All these countries getting together, each of them coming there with their agendas. Biden came with his agenda. He somehow decides that he wants to spend $100 billion on the Ukraine thing and, and, and all this crazy stuff that's going on. But he, that within his running for office, all the other people running for office, they're really coming to these COP meetings, going to give all that up and say, what can we do to be the first ones to, to try and heal the planet? And that's why we're having so, so much trouble, right? So it actually, in, in, in many ways, this is the biggest obstacle because it creates this contrary loyalty and because it's so pathological. Again, like all these other ones, it's so obviously pathological because you obviously can't defend your part without defending the whole. Any good patriot would know, I have to, we have to do everything we can to stop the climate crisis, and not just the climate crisis, which by the way is simply a symptom of the extraction crisis, right? Everybody's climate, climate, climate. Well, that's just one symptom of the whole extraction pathology, right? So unless we deal with these and the biodiversity that we require, right? The webs of life that we require and that your country requires, your country will cease to exist. America's not going to be there on a dead planet. Hungary, France, India, they're not going to Brazil, they're not going to be there on a dead planet. So it's pathological to think that, oh, I can keep doing this, but I'll somehow survive the, the death of the planet, which our nationalism is creating. Again, the only word I can come up with it is pathological. It's, it is a true dysfunction. And again, I hate to keep repeating myself, Georgia, but <laughs> everybody out there, when have you heard any environmental organization or any environmental leader talk this way about nationalism? I haven't. I haven't heard Bill McKibben. I love him, but I haven't heard him talk about it. My old pal Jeremy Rifkin, my good friend Ralph Nader. I have never heard a single one of them say this when it's clearly the case. There's no, I don't see any argument against it. And unless somehow nations can somehow transform themselves to be what they're not, right? So, we, so how do we go and when you need to go from nationalism and hyper nationalism? And that's another point to make here, by the way. Nationalism isn't getting better it's getting a lot worse. Nationalism is already a problem before we got to hyper-nationalism, which is what we're seeing all around the planet right now. You've got Trump, you've got Orban, you've got the woman in Italy, you've got Modi, you've got, you, you name it, right? Putin, all of them, hyper and hyper, hyper-nationalism. So it's going worse. And again, that's always associated with anti-environmentalism because again, they don't want environmental concerns to interrupt their power and their economic future of their country, which their power depends on. Right? So where do we go? What's the paradigm shift? Well, it's pretty clear, right? We go, need to go from nationalism to the earth, right? Our loyalty has to shift. We need a massive loyalty to think that we are earth citizens. We are earthlings. We are earth citizens primarily. We can have dual citizenship if you want, but the primary, logically, the primary loyalty has to be as a citizen of the earth, because without that, the other, your other citizen, American citizen, whatever, is not gonna, not gonna make it, right? And also it's so much more beautiful, right? It's so much more beautiful to think of this beautiful blue planet as the thing you're most loyal to and that you're willing to die for versus American empire. Or God help us what's going on, what was going on in the Middle East now what's going on there in Ukraine. So, and then what is Earth, what, what would be an alternative organization? This is something that Randy Hayes and I are, you know, so interested in as well as you heard that on Saturday, is what about a bioregional, right? The Earth divides itself into bioregions or ecoregions. You can, that's really the organization of the Earth. So what a thought, huh? what a vision. We live in a mutually enhancing relationship with the planet partially well, partially because we will be in bioregions. And unlike competitive nations, bioregions understand that they rely on each other for their survival. It's not competition, it's cooperation. And instead of this Darwinian, you know, end of, you know, the empire 
kind of thing that we're seeing with China and the United States, where the most powerful countries, again, in Darwinian fashion, are taking all the resources they can from these smaller countries. And that's how the last resources of the Earth are going to get exhausted in this mega fight. Instead of that, we have an Earth Confederation of bioregions with bioregional economies. Yeah. Now, we, in many of these areas, like suspicion of pesticides that are biocides, we've come a long way. We're not, if you go think of A to Z, we're probably a D, E, F, G. A lot of people understand they're buying organic, right? So in many of the paradigms I've been talking about, we're already moving. It's not like we got to go from A to Z to each of them. Not, not going to happen, right? We've gone towards, that's my favorite word, by the way, towards. You're not going to get to Z, go toward. Are we going towards Z? Are we going towards that vision, right? Towards, my favorite word. Are we going towards it, right? So in this one, we're not. I really do not see, you know, except with except a very, very few people in any, by the way, this is the same issue. Do you care as much about a kid in Yemen as you do a, a kid in California? So this nationalism isn't just affecting this issue. I believe it distorts our humanity, our sense of social justice, and, and almost every aspect of our, of, of our lives. So nationalism to earth citizen, citizenship and advocacy with that level of loyalty, right? And then to the beginning of an investigation, exploration of what bioregional economies might look like and how that organization might, might be, right? Okay, last, I promise, uh, but maybe the most complex. Um, so how do we go from industrial consciousness to ecological consciousness? And in whatever time I have remaining, um, I'll, I want to explore an idea I have with you folks and see, see what you think. And you, we can comment on this if, if you find it intriguing enough. You, does everybody here know about privilege, white privilege? Uh, yeah, George, you're, you're nodding. You know, white privilege, uh, class privilege, uh, uh, sex privilege, right? And these, what they mean there is an unconscious, innate assumption having to do with the circumstances of your birth. And that in certain areas and certain cultures, if you're born wealthy, you think the wealthy are virtuous or think that they at least have the right to power and that poor people are probably there because of some personal failing. That's just sort of an innate way, you know, sort of the uh, Mitt Romney, makers and takers things, right? It's an innate thing. And, and everyone's getting EDI training, including my own organization, and I think it's very worthwhile. I'm a psychotherapist as well as being a lawyer. So I think looking at our unconscious thing makes us fuller human beings. Seeing if there's something that's separating us from our other human beings means that we're not fully human. We're not fully humane. We're not fully with one another, you know, brothers and sisters, which we need to be. So that I, I have no issue with that, except when it's weaponized. When people don't say, hey, I'm not really trying to find out this so that we can become more full with one another and more, you know, redolent with understanding. No, no, I want to actually weaponize it because you're white or because you're male. That's, that does a great disservice to that idea. But we now know that environmental groups are having a tremendous problem with this. Because a lot of the uh, staff, London is saying, hey, we've got to move into these privileges, right? And I think it can be useful. But we even had Ben Jealous recently appointed head of Sierra Club. And Ben is a wonderful guy, you know, he's, but he's not an environmental guy. He hasn't spent his life working, you know, for the planet, for what we're doing. So they brought him in. So what, how do we respond to that? How do we deal with that? So the three aspects are, of this are a one group in, in, in human society feels superior to another innately. In order to maintain that, it projects its inferior traits onto another group. That way it absolves itself of those traits and projects it onto that group, which is then stigmatized. Then now that that group is holding all that inferiority and the group still sees itself as superior, it feels it has the right to discriminate against that group it feels the right it may need to exploit that group, oppress that group, and perhaps extirpate that group, right? Because now you're projecting all your negative things on that group, Jews, Blacks, you name it, gays. Now I want to actually exterminate them because I've projected all my, at least, in, un, at least unconsciously, because I've taken all my inferior functions onto them, and now I want to get rid of those, metaphorically, symbolically, unconsciously, right? Well, does that help us with our ecological work here? Oh, I think it does. I'm working with an idea called human privilege, right? EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion. What about diversity? 
What about inclusion of the, all the other non-human species? We have been brought up in industrial society because of our technological advancement and the use of nature as commodities solely for our use, that we are ensconced in human privilege. We feel superior to the rest of creation. We feel like we're the culmination of evolution. We feel like we have the right to utilize nature in any way we want, even to genetically engineer it, to suit our principles, to, to literally look at all of nature as natural resources. Natural resources, how many, how many environmentalists use the term natural resources? The minute they do, they've fallen into human privilege. Because natural resources, by definition, means nature used for nature available for human use. Right? 25 states call their environmental protection Department of Natural Resources. Canada, their environmental protection agency, Canada Natural Resources. Mexico, Mexico Natural Resources. Renewable resources, non-renewable. For whom? Non-renewable for the whales? Renewable for the butterflies? Right? Natural resources is the language of human privilege. The Natural Resources Defense Council should change its name to the Nature Resource Defense Council. Right? And by the way, we even project our negative things onto things. If you call somebody an animal, is that a compliment? If you say somebody's beastly, is that a compliment? Right? Somebody's really racist, you call a racist pig. Right? Cops, pigs, when they're when they're abusive. Those poor pigs, 129 million of which we kill each year for our use, I don't think they deserve those that opprobrium. I really don't. But it's not everything I talked about today. The reason it exists is human privilege. The unconscious assumption, innate assumption and bias that all of this is made for us. So of course market economics is gonna work. So of course we can be wedded into nationalism. Of course we can extract as much as we want. Of course we're gonna be able to kill and eradicate those things that are inconvenient for us. Of course we can, because it's all made for us. And we have confirmation bias because 80% of Americans live in cities and urban areas. 55% of the world's population now lives in urban areas. So they're no longer in touch with those natural systems. They're no longer in touch with those non-human earth life communities. All we see around us is humans in interaction, our economy versus economy. All we see is our politics. All we get on MSNBC, all these things that we see are filled with human issues, but never the issues of the human's relationship to the rest. And we're never going to be we're never going to find peace among ourselves. We're never going to find peace among nations unless we make peace with nature. And we're never going to do that until we realize that we are equal partners and that those aspects of nature need to have their rights and they need to have their survival and they need to be privileged just as we are and that we depend on them. So we shouldn't have a declaration of independence that belongs to that other thing. God bless, wonderful things in there. We need a declaration of interdependence. Understand that each and all of us is linked. And until we understand that mutually enhancing link and we get rid of this human privilege, which is the basic consciousness problem with industrial society, we're not gonna make this a really important transformation from the industrial society and its disastrous zombie-like presence still, because it's totally, as I've, Noted, there's no future there to the future that we have to have. Thanks, Georgia. Oh, this is incredible, Andy. I mean, I feel like what you have said today has has just made me feel alive again in a way. I think you and Randy really present a whole picture that I wish everybody could hear. And one of the things I wanted to bring up, because it's so all encompassing, that's what's really important about it. You don't leave anything out. I want to bring up one piece before I open it up to questions from the people on the group. Uh, and that is, you know, going back to the war economy and looking at some of the obstacles that you talked about earlier today. And one of them is the war economy and nationalism. I see them sort of going together because nationalism is a used is used as a way of manipulating people to support the wars. And what we're seeing right now, what has really bothered some of us in the progressive corner is the split in the progressive community about the Russia-Ukraine war. 
And I think those who are seeing a bigger picture versus those who are looking at just there's a, one country invaded another. So I'd like you to talk about nationalism as, as you see it in that war with the US position in that war and, um, and how you see this, these wars blocking our, any way of getting to an ecological uh, state of consciousness. Yeah, I, I, I hope I'm, I'm going to state something pretty controversial here. And, the, the, you know, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You just asked me a question, which I am going to answer. But I hope that people who vehemently disagree don't dismiss the rest of what I have said over the last 50 minutes, because they, they and I respect your disagreement on this. My own family is in disagreement about this. Right. But in my view, the basic problem here is the idea of empire and the idea of hegemony. This nationalism I talked to doesn't just stay within borders. We know that. We, we know we go empires all the way back. Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, British Empire, half the world, right? And then that last really big empire is the American Empire, right? And the idea among certain American foreign policy people that America should have hegemony over the world, that we are the world's policemen. We're the leaders of the free world. Right. This is the, the messaging. And so what happened here is that after the Soviet Union broke down, Gorbachev did that rather impulsively, but he did it. And in many ways, it's amazing. Uh, the U.S. said, we're going to let it go. We had this Cold War. We're going to let it go. You know, if you let Germany get united, we, we're, we're not going to put American missiles all the way through the Warsaw countries, much less your Soviets. They can be neutral. You got to play, behave. And that was promised. But starting in 1999, the Clinton administration, people like Strobe Talbot, Victoria Nuland, we know this whole neocon group, just like they went into Iraq, just like they went into Libya, said, no, we want to actually surround Russia, you know, and really finally win that war, win that hegemony. And they went all the way because the 1300 mile border with Ukraine and Russia. Right. And so they pushed it all the way into that. That was their plan from 2008 on. Right. And and Putin was too interested in trying to get, keep his economy going. And then when they finally they overthrew the elected government of Ukraine in 2014, and that war started and now we call the Donbass area, you know, Putin got involved there. And I think Putin made a terrible mistake in invading. I think he needed to go to the countries of the NATO countries. And I think he needed to go to others, including China and Brazil and India and say this. Look what look what they're doing. No other country would accept this. America would not accept it. No one would accept having an enemy's missiles a few hundred miles from your capital on a 1300 mile. No one else would accept that, folks. Instead, he acted, in my view, impulsively and remembering now that Russia has uh, one third the GDP of California and that Italy has one third greater GDP than Russia. So how do you start a war when that's your economic situation? Very impulsive. And I think, you know, he'll pay a certain price. And But I think the point, the larger point you're making is that is part of the nationalist distraction. It's not just the military industrial. It's not just that Austin and Sullivan are totally invested and we're on the board of these military companies, these defense car contractors who are making these $100 billion. They are on those boards. That corruption is there. But it's more than that. It's how you galvanize your country to reignite that passion, that nationalist pa you know, passion and the myth of your own country. Nothing could be further than what we're talking about, which is looking as your primary loyalty to be the planet and understanding that we need to make peace with the planet so that we can make peace with ourselves. So we're not having wars over oil. We're not having wars over water, right? And we're not creating the enormous environmental destruction that these wars create. So it's a mixture of the pathology of economics, right? And the pathology of, of nationalism and hyper-nationalism brought together. And again, I know no, no greater obstacle than, and, it, and particularly when that nationalism, that hyper-nationalism goes beyond borders. And I think Putin has done that, but I think he was definitely provoked into doing that. And I think that was a terrible foreign policy mistake. And I know John Mearsheimer and Jeffrey Sachs and a number of George Kennan and a lot of other people thought so. I'm not alone on that. Uh, and But any, we live in a multipolar world. We need to, America needs to exist that and then go, go from multipolar to a uni-Earth world. Hegemony empires are a thing of the past. Uh, and I think continue to try that hegemony 
is so dangerous in a nuclear world that it's, it, it, you know, it's getting up at two in the morning these days and going, what are we doing? Why do we have a war with Russia on Ukraine territory, US war in Russia? So it's, it's, it's another form of pathology. And I find it, you know, very dispiriting uh, to see so many people and progressives brought into supporting a war like this without knowing its history, but also just on principle. Yeah. You know, not, not calling for peace. Even if you were to support we this, why go on with this crazy jingoism? New York Times, everyone else. Let's the, you know the Pope is right. Other people get from the beginning. There was a there will be a settlement on this. For goodness sakes, you know, find peace. But of course, then you're out a hundred million dollars, and you're out this whole jingoistic thing. You know, look, yeah, look, yeah. And by the way, were we sanctioned? Was the United States? I shouldn't say we. Was the United States sanctioned for our war in Iraq? No. Talk about invasion. Yeah. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy involved here, too, since Biden supported that. That invasion was soon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, I warned you that you're going to get an answer. I apologize. No, that, for that. That's what I was looking answer. for. And yeah. I think, you know, what, what a lot of people don't want, and this is something, another block we're up against, is that our culture has educated us to not like complexity. We want binary with or against um black or white we don't like complexity that makes us think more question more sit with ambiguity it's very hard we haven't been trained to be able to do that so i think what you're talking about is showing us yes we have to be able to do that it, uh because our vision any vision for an ecological society requires it um i'm going to open it up for people's questions um and it might take a minute or so because sometimes people are thinking and uh, when you're called on, you can unmute, but please don't unmute unless you're called on so that way we don't have extra noise. Um, while we're waiting, oh, here's a hand. Okay, Linda. So I, I agree with everything you've said, but where is the impetus for a, a uni hegemon, hegemonic world gonna come from? The UN, where, I mean, where's it gonna come from? Um. One of the terrible places it's going to come from is the consequences that we're going to continue to be paying for this. I'm not just talking about extreme weather events. I'm talking about water. Uh, you know, we can survive without food for quite a while, about three days without water. You know, I always say people say the end of the oil. Yeah, but it's going to be the end of the water first, and it's going to be much more traumatic. And we're already seeing that in the West Coast. We're already seeing that around the world. We're seeing it in China. Some of this is coming home to roost. This is a long emergency, but it is still, it's already a huge emergency. And I hate to say it, but sometimes that's what it takes us procrastinating humans sometimes to, to really, you know, be lulled into action. But but here's here's an answer to that as well. Let's assume that we have the hard landing, the big collapse that Randy sometimes and a lot of other people talking about is a train wreck. And I don't look forward to that. But unless we have a narrative it doesn't have to be exactly the narrative I just came up with, but unless we have a narrative of where we went wrong, that this isn't about immigrants ruining our, our society, this isn't about you know one ethnic group or another, that's not why we're in the, the trouble we're in and the earth is in the trouble we're in. There's a narrative, but no one's telling that narrative. But if we if we if all of us get together in our books, our articles that we're talking about, and begin to get that narrative out there that this is really endemic to industrial, the pathologies of industrial culture, industrial society, despite all the benefits it gave us, that at least begins a narrative. So when history comes to meet us, we have a, they, they know that we have a narrative and we have a way out. Right now, there is no narrative, so it's scapegoating, right? Something happens, 2008, suddenly Trump comes in. People get angry. It's, it's the problem of certain groups, but they don't understand the very simple and basic pathologies that are behind all of this. And we've done a very poor job, in my view, in the environmental community to really get that narrative out there. It's all about narratives. It's all about stories. And simply being reformist and talking about climate all the time, that's not going to do it. We need to have a much more transformative, exciting vision, especially for young people, that they can respond to and not just, you know, try and stop this or stop that. But there is a vision out there. There's a vision of how we could live. There's a vision of how we could interact with the earth. There is a beauty to having loyalty to the earth. There's a beauty of the idea of being, I would guess right now that if there was a big enough campaign that you could get 10, 20, 30 million people to say, I am willing to pledge my loyalty to the earth and as an earth advocate over my, over my nation state. 
especially young people. I say they were tired of that. We're tired of the wars. We're tired of all the Trumps and Urbans and all of the other crap. We we really do believe that our loyalty should be part of the earth. I believe there's, a, especially among young people, a tremendous number of people that would do that tomorrow. I just want to take it a little bit further. I agree with you completely, but where's the leadership for that coming? I mean, I, I if we if we're talking about collapse first, then I would see it possibly coming from the regional bio, as you said, the re, uh, bio regional. You know, we're going to have to reorganize ourselves maybe from the ground up, and then maybe grow towards that. I don't see any leadership coming any other place for that for what you're suggesting. I wish they were, but I don't see it. Yeah. You know, um... You know, we're required to be faithful, not necessarily successful. Um, we're faithful to our vision. Uh, but, you know, I think of myself as a leader. I think every half the people, everybody on this call is a leader. We all can be leaders, leaders in our communities, leaders with the stuff we write, leaders that we talk about. You know, you know, let's not, you know, if, if you know, you don't like history, make history. You don't like the news, make the news. You know, um, I certainly do that in the stopping the bleeding in my organization. You know, again, we, you know, in the three times the Supreme Court, we've made some history, but this pair, this consciousness stuff is harder. I'm not, I'm not pretending it's not. It's just, we have to get the word out. You know, I mean, it took me a long time to come up with these very simple paradigms. They, they sound so obvious, don't they? But it, it took me, and I think about this all the time. It took me like three or four years to, to really work this out. And I only gave you about half or a third of what I've, I've done, but still, you know, and I would sit in a forehead slap or desk face slap that was so simple. How come I didn't see that? How come I haven't been talking about that for the last 30 years, you know? So that's why um, we'll have you back two more times to get <laughs> to the other two thirds. Uh, but I think about this stuff all the time too. So I totally understand. I'm going to go to John Steiner now. Uh, Randy, obviously. Uh, Randy. Hi, Randy. Hey, Andy. <laughs> Andy, Randy. It's all the same. Andy, Randy. What the heck? Randy's um, on too. To follow up on George's question in the previous one, are you, I've got th two or three points here. Are you finding any resonance in the environmental community at all? Number one. Number two, have you spoken to folks like an indivisible? And three, it sounds like you're beginning to write about this and put it together. You've certainly given us a praises, as it were. But I could imagine a slide deck where you, because you've laid this out in such good logical order that could be a tool to move this. And again, I guess the other question is, are you in a position to convene whoever you think is convenable <laughs> uh, where there's a proclivity toward this understanding and consciousness and, and see where that goes? Yeah, John, um, so Randy and I set up the Earth Advocacy Institute about a year and a half and the idea of the Earth Advocacy Institute is exactly what you just expressed. The idea is to take these paradigms and bring the best people together who are already working on a lot of this, but have them come together in a way they haven't around a united vision, right, of this transformation and, and bring them together in an institute. Reminds me a little of what we did with the International Forum on Globalization. I don't know if you knew much about the IFG. I was a founding board member of that and we had tremendous accomplishments there. So, and it's a little like our international Alliance for Climate and Agriculture right now. I love creating these things. And I think this is something I, I'd like to devote much of the rest of my life to is having this Earth Advocacy Institute to get people together to go, because each of these paradigms needs a lot more working out and a lot more ideas and a lot more support. So how can we do that? And I want to bring at least a really great group together uh, and, and see if we can't do that through the, um, and the other thing that we're doing, um, and we do possibly have some significant funding for this, depending on whether it is to actually begin a, a an Earth Citizen uh, campaign, or you know, uh, basically uh, trying to get as many people as we can who would sign on to that, who would say, you know, I want dual dual citizenship. So take them halfway towards, but my primary loyalty is to the Earth. But I'm only American or Hungarian or, or British or Brazilian second. So that's going to be interesting to see as well. But I think my passion here is to get an institute together. I, this is becoming a book. Uh, what I tell you today is part of a book I'm writing and, and also a slideshow, by the way, uh, so other people can use it. And um, hopefully that can be the basis for, for the institute's at least founding 
in, in a website and all that kind of thing. So that's our that's our plan. John, we're gonna do the best we can. Are any of these organizations off the ground that we can find on a website? The Earth Advocacy or the Citizen Earth Campaign? Um, the, the Earth Citizen thing is, you know, people have one information, I can send them the entire Precy. Uh, we have a sig potentially significant funder. I'm just trying to work out how that would actually work. I've, I'm not a online person, Georgia. I'm not a webmaster or meister or whatever. And obviously, in today's world, you, you know, it would be it'd be a little like a Vaz or Change.org. It would have to have that like kind of reach. So I'm trying to understand more of that and see how that reach would go. I would also love to have in person or citizen meetings or citizen salons or citizen flag or citizen anthem. I'd like to maybe write one myself. Uh, so I, I don't want to write it. And co write it. I just don't want it to be online only. I want it to be in, 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 you know, Randy was able to, with Rainforest Action, he had college campuses, you know, all devoted to Rainforest. I'd like to see it, but not just online, but it's going to have to start online. And I'm just trying to be, even as we speak, I'm trying to get more acquainted with what that would look like and, and, and how that might go forward. Great. I want to call on Ned now. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm hiding. I can't get my camera to work because I'm not adept at that. But this is so thrilling, Andrew. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that you're operationalizing Thomas Berry's idea of moving from one biogeological era to another one. The whole shift to the Ecozoic. That's mm -hmm. been that that caught me, put me on fire when I first read about that. And now, oh, here's how you do it. One, two, three, four, well, the seven steps. But right. anyway, yeah. I'm so thrilled. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ned. Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, Father, I'm gonna call him Father Thomas because that's what I always called him. Um, um, and I were very close. And um, I was there a couple of weeks before his death in North Carolina. And he looked at me, you know, in a way, like, you know, you gotta move this forward, right? You know, I love what you do, Andrew. Um, I love what you're doing in the other work, but you know you gotta, this is what you need to move forward. So um, I went, came back from that um, and I said to Randy, you wanna join me in our, in this quest? And so we started Foundation Earth and then we got, when well, we honed it down to this and started the Earth Advocacy Institute. It, you are absolutely correct, Ned. It really, Father Thomas was the inspiration for me to really move forward with this and to realize I don't particularly like the term echozaic. So uh, I like this transformation from industrial to it's, it's more, again, more, more humble. Remember, he was a cosmologist, right? And Brian Swim, and that's way beyond my pay scale. But I'm, what I talked to you about today is more within my pay scale. I'm not sure how this fits within the cosmology. I remember saying to Father Thomas at breakfast, uh, you know, Father Thomas, I think we really need to pursue this idea of Earth citizen. And he said, Andrew, Earth citizen? What about citizen of the universe? <laughs> <laughs> That's so Thomas, right? And I said, Father Thomas, can I start with the earth? I know you and Brian and great. I love the whole universe thing, but I'm a little more humble. Can we just try the earth thing first? You know, true story. I bet it is. Uh, I think John wanted to ask something else. We're going to close off the question soon, but if anyone else wants to ask one, you need to put your hand up now. So I'll go to you, John. Uh, Andy, I'll put myself in the, the thrilling inspired category. You know, I just encourage you to put out a draft of a simple slide deck because the basic ideas are here. I know from an academic, research, professional, uh, be acceptable point of view, it needs more research, but the germ and the gist is here and it's inspiring just as it is. And I think this could move perhaps more quickly than you think. And we know some other people who are thinking as big and globally as you are, both online and in person. And we can talk about that offline together. Great, John. Much appreciated. Yeah. Got a very good suggestion. We'll work on it. We'll get it done. You are uh, getting it done. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I definitely want to stay plugged into all of this, Andy. I just wanted to tell you that. And hopefully we could have uh, another chat next week. Us. Absolutely. Well, we'll get stuck on Bach though. And, and no, and no, no. I we'll have to put off Bach to the end of the conversation. Move that because you know I, you'll talk about that forever. Just one, one quick thing. I just to finish a little bit here um, is that you know 
and I feel this all the time. So this, I'm not on top of this mountain, but you know, the opposite of, of courage is despair. And I really, you know, those of us who see, as we see so many of us on this call, and those of us who are sensitive and whose feeling function feels for the other communities of the earth, it's sometimes very difficult, difficult for me. Anyway, um, it's to be avoided. They would want our courage. And I would remind us all that courage comes from the word core, which means the heart, right? It's not just the solar plexus chakra involved. It's that heart chakra too, courage from the heart. And I think if we continue to work in that way and we're faithful to our vision, you know, remember that's the first thing is all of us to share that vision together. You know, we won't get burned out and we won't get despaired and discouraged, right? If we're faithful to the vision, then we don't have to worry about success. We will, that will refresh us. It's refreshed me. And I hope the same for all of you. Great. I want to thank you, um, Andy. This has just been extraordinary. And I think it's going to cause us <laughs> to have a lot of discussions afterwards. We have a discussion scheduled for Praxis members on the 26th of the, of the last Friday of this month. I think it's the 26th. And I really want to discuss the... Um, program that, that Randy presented and yours uh, together and have people read it, watch these programs, and then have a discussion of what you both have presented. I think it's really profound and it's exactly where we need to go. Well, so thank I'm you, Georgia, thrilled. for giving us the opportunity. You know, Randy and I just talk to each other all the time. It's really <laughs> nice to be able to have other people to share this with and get, get some feedback from, because after a while, you're not sure, is this crazy or is this a pretty... Oh, to proceed, you know. So no. I appreciate it so much. I really do. Uh, and, and I always appreciate your work as well. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you so much again because this has taken us to another level today. And uh, I think it gives us gives us a lot to focus on. Sometimes with all the distractions going on in the news and in our world, it just feels like there's no place where we can focus in and get something done on a systemic level and this takes us to that reality and possibility so thank you for that thank you I'm and hey folks if you haven't if you didn't see randy check out his his, his talk oh Let's yeah see. i sent everybody the link to that and after today you're going to get the video links to both randy's talk and andy's so you'll get both of those the randy andy show the randy and andy show that's what <laughs> i always call it randy didn't say anything he's well, probably bored He's, he's on. Heard, he's heard this all before. Yeah. <laughs> Only difference is she's over a, a glass of wine or two. Okay. <laughs> all right, Which I'm not to go to, by the way. I'm going to stop the recording.